Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I want to talk about how um, mistakes and failure and uh, fuck-ups can, can influence your career in a very positive way. Uh, I recently made a book about this called uh, Failed It, and uh, this describes the fact uh, that we, I mean, we live now in an area of time where everything is almost perfect. I mean, not the world is perfect, but within the creative industry, we have a lot of tools that are close to perfection. So, the, um, uh, I mean, the, the camera on our phones, they are almost perfect. Uh, we, we need almost like uh, applications to fuck up our own images, to let them look very authentic. Or the navigation systems are perfect, they bring you exactly where you want to be. And our computers, they make no mistakes. And mistakes, that is in a way, I mean, perfection is not really a good starting point for uh, new creativity and for new work. So, this book uh, writes about how you can kind of influence your own uh, fuck-ups. And uh, it's uh, also in Polish, so uh, that helps probably here. So, again, I think uh, to start with, I like to say that um, uh, as a creative, you need to make an idiot out of yourself at least once a day. I mean, uh, creative people, they have to be also a little bit uh, clowns. And, uh, I mean, a lot of people take themselves so seriously that, um, yeah, it's almost unbearable. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, the, the making a fool out of yourself also helps your creativity. Um, I mean, I can, uh, I have a little bit of experience in that because um, my partner and I, we started in London in an uh, agency, and uh, this was in 1994, and uh, at a certain moment, the atmosphere in the agency was not very, uh, very spectacular, it was very uh, bad mood in the agency. So we uh, decided one day to rent uh, two chicken suits and appear in the chicken suits at work. And um, yeah, like the, uh, at least to cheer up the people a little bit. Some people uh, had a little bit of a laugh, but others uh, didn't really like it. And uh, the result was that uh, two weeks later we got fired because of these uh, chicken suits. So. Uh, I mean, uh, but it brought also kind of a positive thing because we thought like, okay, why can we not uh, do it ourselves? And then uh, we uh, decided to move back to Amsterdam and start our own agency. And this is our first company picture, talking about making a fool out of yourself. I mean, uh, it's me on the left if you don't recognize me anymore. Uh, but uh, so this was our first uh, company picture. And uh, then we uh, decided to start Kessels Kramer um, yeah, this is our logo, we just uh, didn't know what to do else. So we went to a hardware shop and we found this kind of uh, horse with a horseshoe and uh, still at the moment it's on our door and we don't have big neon signs, but uh, this is our logo. And um, yeah, we work in Amsterdam in a former church and uh, it's like a big open space where you can work with a lot of people. I mean, it's very uh, positive as well because you can tell your mother that you go to church every day. That helps. And um, yeah, it's like one open space where a lot of people work together. We work with uh, about 30 people in the church. It's maybe a strange combination doing communication and advertising in the church, but uh, I mean, the church was also all about propaganda, let's be honest. And um, yeah, also we have a, um, an office in London called KK Outlet, and this is more like a gallery, uh, a workspace, and a shop uh, all in one. And um, uh, yeah, here uh, we do every six weeks, we show uh, work of uh, people that we like, some of our own uh, artworks in the gallery. And uh, it's always very busy there uh, every six weeks on a Thursday. But soon I found out that it has to do with the free beers that we're giving, because uh, after the beers are finished, the place is totally empty. And uh, so let's go a little bit into the work. And um, I think this is uh, very important to say, like when nobody hates your work, there's also not a lot of people who love it, and vice versa, maybe. Uh, I think like uh, you have to be very explicit with your work, very uh, extreme in a way, because in a way that is also creativity. I mean, uh, to make something boring in the middle of the road, that is not really so-called creative. So when you're creative, you need to find those extremes, I think, and uh, that means that sometimes uh, people also really hate your work, but that is something very good, I think. Uh, but I'll, I'll get back to that later. Uh, maybe a good example, I, I did uh, the theme and the logo and motto for the city of Amsterdam called uh, I Amsterdam. And um, 
here it was like a pitch that uh, the city council uh, made and uh, there were five uh, agencies, uh, design agencies involved. And uh, when we got the briefing, to be honest, on the way back to the office, which took uh, 10 minutes, we already had the idea of I Amsterdam uh, on the way back. So we thought in the office, maybe it's very good to have a look like um, uh, if this theme is already existing. So we did like a, uh, a check on the, on the name I Amsterdam and it was not there yet. And uh, on the same day as we got the briefing, we decided to uh, register the name I, Am I Amsterdam ourselves, which was quite a lot of money. It was like something like 15,000 euro. So it was quite a risk. Uh, the presentation was two, uh, two weeks later. And um, yeah, we had a lot of time to make quite a good presentation. And, but after I did the presentation, uh, all the people, uh, there were like 20 people there, and everybody was deadly silent. There was nobody who gave any reaction. So uh, I, I asked, like, is there anything wrong? Or, uh, but nobody said anything, and then one woman raised her hand and she said, like, yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry, but the people, the design agency that just presented in, in front, uh, before you had exactly the same idea. And... Uh, yeah, that was kind of a shock, but uh, then I said, like, uh, yeah, but the uh, theme, the motto is ours because we bought it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that, uh, they looked quite surprised, but uh, in the end, uh, they went even further, tried another agency uh, uh, to make, come up with another idea. But funny enough, of the five agencies that were involved, in the end, there were three of them that had the same theme. So this also shows that sometimes these things are quite uh, on the surface and they are uh, very um, yeah, present. And, and uh, so it's also, I think, very good that when you are very uh, sure about what you make and what you come up with, it's also good to own that and to be very responsible with it uh, yourself before you even present it. I mean, the I Amsterdam... Funny enough, now it got a lot of copies, and uh, now I'm collecting those copies because there's also Wow Moscow that uh, I just uh, discovered, and uh, exactly the same uh, typography and or uh, whatever, or the same white and red. And then there's also Only Lyon, so that's uh, another one. And uh, last week I uh, discovered that we have also We Are Ramallah, so. Um, I mean, uh, but there's many more of them, uh, that's quite funny. Another work, uh, and we worked for six years for Diesel, uh, the, the jeans company. Here, uh, it's an, an ad, uh, a whole campaign that we did about the fact that people nowadays want to stay younger and younger constantly. So we came up with this idea that we made these perfect uh, models with silicon masks and then uh, we ju just gave all kinds of tips how they could uh, save themselves. So, for instance, by drink drinking urine in this uh, case. And uh, another one is uh, like for Vitra, the furniture company. Uh, this is like that uh, Eames uh, chair and it says like uh, uh, guaranteed to stay in the family. So, uh, it's a chair that you keep for a long, long time. Um, another uh, uh, foundation we work for is called Women Inc. Uh, it's a found foundation by and for women with uh, certain uh, female topics that they uh, address. And uh, for instance, this was a campaign that we did uh, because it, it turns out that women in their working life still earn 300,000 euro less than men. So in this case, all these women were looking for their 300,000 euro. And... Uh, uh, another uh, example is for the um, uh, Standard, is a hotel in, uh, in America, they have five hotels. And here we did all kinds of things with the theme that the hotel is anything but standard. So uh, we found all these guest comments and, uh, and, and in a way we kind of uh, uh, redid uh, these guest comments in a funny way. So I, I stayed maybe three weeks in the hotel with a photographer and we made those ideas on the spot. So this was a guest comment that a girl said, like, uh, have you seen that your sign on, your, on the hotel is uh, upside down? And uh, she thought it was very uh, remarkable. And uh, another one is like a, a ping pong bar that they have. So I saw once that one ball was trying to go down on the escalator, but it was constantly being moved up. So we uh, threw like uh, hundreds of balls down there. And finally, there's, um, um, yeah, like uh, I, I saw this guy in front of the hotel while having breakfast, 
uh, this guy, this Jesus guy in the same dress was passing the hotel. This was in Hollywood. And uh, so we asked him to, if he could star in, in the ad and uh, brought him to the swimming pool, put two chairs in the swimming pool on top of each other, and he was standing on there. So the, 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 the picture was taken five minutes later after we saw the guy. Yeah, uh, the next is a, um, uh, a commercial, like a TV ad for a radio station. And, I mean, you have to, uh, you have to know that, I mean, I, I work maybe uh, 20 years in design and advertising, but uh, I also really hate advertising, I mean, every day. And I think a lot of people here and everywhere, they really hate advertising because there's so much bad stuff and so many compromises made. And, uh, but in a way that, for me, that's also a, a big uh, motivation to work in the industry because in many cases when you just take a side street and do something totally different, then uh, that is uh, uh, working often quite well. In this case, it was for a radio station and uh, the, there was an event like the World Cup of Soccer and everybody does then the same on Dutch television. So we just tried to change that uh, a little bit. So again, for a radio station. Yeah, the animal rights organization was not very happy with us. They uh, actually they gave us phone calls. They wrote us letter that they were very angry with this uh, spot, because and then they even demanded that we had to make another spot to prove that the dog was still alive. And uh, of course, in our case, we really like that. I mean, uh, don't tell us what to do because then we do it. So. Um, we made another spot where we, uh, I mean, the next event for the radio station was the Tour de France. So, and then uh, the, um, we made another spot where the same model or the same guy with the same dog was coming back again. Yeah, then uh, we never heard from them anymore. They never gave a call and uh, it was totally uh, finished, the whole business. Um, yeah, this is a more design job for a uh, museum in uh, Dusseldorf in Germany. Um, what you see is that a lot of uh, corporate identities of uh, Musea, for instance, are very stiff and very static. And uh, while a lot of their stuff in the museum is constantly changing, so we thought uh, it's good to change that uh, a little bit in this case. Uh, we, we took like a white canvas to start with, uh, made that graphic. The museum is called NOA Forum Dusseldorf, so it has a lot of uh, these canvases. And then we filled it constantly with different types. So it's constantly uh, generating new uh, type and also on their posters and communication, constantly everything is changed, but you still see that it comes from the same uh, source, in a way, from that same museum. But also, uh, outdoor and in the museum, we try to use this square and uh, put all kinds of motivational text in there. Uh, so this one says, like, place to dance. This is just where people have a smoke outside. And uh, it says, like, hug zone or uh, room for discussion. And uh, also in the museum, all the people they are working there, they have all a white uh, sweater, and, uh, but then they're all mixed. So the, 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 the director has the sweater of the security, the security of the shop manager, the shop manager of the curator. So it's kind, kind of confusing, and that, that is also in a way what a museum should be, in a way. Um, also, you have these benches in museums, very boring always. They have them as well, but uh, here it says like uh, normal, different, better, so you can decide where to sit. Or this one says uh, father, mother, child, animal friend, so you can choose as well. Uh, there's a, a random sign in the in a corner which says corner, so it points in the corner, and uh, so it's quite good to know, you know, like when you're in a museum, what. Where is the corner? Uh, and then this is like the, the locker area. So it says like uh, mini bar, 
schlechte Laune, which means uh, bad mood, so you can also lock up your bad mood. Uh, there is the wardrobe, which says, bitte keine Hosen, which means, uh, please no trousers, you have to keep them on. And uh, there's a random masterpiece that was already there. And uh, also, um, there is uh, like these buckets for umbrellas at the entrance, and it says like umbrellas and donations, because the museum always needs uh, a lot of donations. Uh, there's a room for rent, just uh, it's empty for a long time there. And uh, also this is the alarm system, uh, just constantly flickering, it says disco. Uh, this is the general signage, which says like uh, childhood, uh, Rome, find your own way, exhibition. Yeah, and then uh, please, no to please no toasters. It's not wanted in the museum. And this is the highest point in the museum, God. And then there's, of course, the toilet, uh, which uh, is for free. <laughs> Another uh, thing we did for uh, a museum in Milan, uh, the Triennale, um, uh, is uh, they, they did uh, last year a big exhibition called uh, Design After Design. And uh, this whole exhibition was about now that we can make everything that we like to make with, uh, or the, with, with design, all the materials we have. Uh, what are we actually making? What is the next big thing? And, and this whole exhibition was questioning that. Uh, and then we made kind of a fake next big thing, which was this yellow thing, which is nothing. Uh, it's just made in five minutes and then uh, through a 3D printer and it looks beautiful. But uh, we just hyped it uh, totally. So everybody's adoring the yellow thing and uh, looking at it. And uh, also in the city you saw people with the yellow thing and uh, on big billboards, and uh, the, 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 the briefing here was quite nice because they asked us to do the communication for uh, this exhibition, but also make it in such a way that the communication could be also a part in the museum and part of the exhibition. So in the museum itself, in the shop, there were all kinds of small models uh, of the yellow thing as a souvenir that you could bring home. Or uh, we made three books writing about the yellow thing, what kind of things you could do with it, and uh, totally uh, nonsense, but uh, at least uh, three books were published about that. And then uh, there was like um, uh, t-shirts, uh, there was also like a little bit of a chapel in the museum where you could watch and kneel down for the real uh, yellow thing and then uh, really adore it and uh, pray to it. And then we did also a film uh, how this yellow thing can be a big role in your life. It's your partner, your navigator, your advisor. It will push you to your limits and beyond. It will make you better, more perceptive and fitter. It's your travel companion, decision maker and confidant. You will learn to love it, play with it, pray to it, get intimate with it. The next big thing is this thing. Yeah, then I think it's also nice when you, I mean, in, in my case, I, I do this for a long time, and every day when I have to come up with a new idea, uh, it's a, as embarrassing as I started. Because, I mean, nobody's born with the talent to come up with brilliant ideas, so everybody needs to work hard. I mean, either you get the idea in the first five minutes, or you have to struggle for it and work for it very hard. I have the same thing, and, um, but sometimes you also have this idea and you think like, okay, this is maybe very impossible to do and it's almost uh, not reachable or it's too stupid. And sometimes that is a very good thing to embrace and to hold on to because that again is also uh, creativity. So um, in our case, uh, this happened with the first client that we ever had, which was back in uh, 1996. Uh, we still work for them, but uh, it's, uh, this was a 500-bed budget hotel in the center of Amsterdam. And uh, yeah, we were very happy that at least somebody called. It was really the first uh, person on the phone. And this uh, hotel owner called and he said, like, uh, listen, uh, can you please help me? Because I am sick of the complaints that I get in my hotel. And um, I mean, uh, can you help me? Because I just want to get rid of it. And uh, so I, I went there the next day to the hotel. And uh, uh, it was really the biggest shithole I saw in my life. Like, really a nightmare. Uh, like. Uh, a lot of rooms, a lot of beds, but it was a chaos like there. And um, 
So, I mean, we were quite unhappy with uh, our first client uh, in the first uh, moment, but uh, we thought, like, uh, yeah, at least let's think about it, because anything you would do for this client, and anything in advertising and design you would do to make it better, uh, would be almost a lie. So, uh, in a way, uh, from the beginning, we thought, like, uh, maybe uh, honesty is their only luxury they have. And that was kind of a strategy that we followed uh, constantly and over the years, always being very honest with kind of an, uh, kind of an ironic uh, twist. So we did posters in the beginning saying, now we're bad in every room, or uh, now even more rooms without a window, or uh, now a door in every room. Uh, there was also, of course, a lot of dog shit in the, at the main entrance, which is not very uh, rare in Amsterdam, because you see everywhere dog shit. So it's quite uh, nice to do that honestly. And also, uh, in the hotel itself, when you check in, I mean, it's quite of an, an embarrassment when you come into the room. And uh, there was this A3 cardboard card on your bed. This is like the bed. And uh, so the card is there. And when you have some scissors on you, you can really cut out all the luxury that you need uh, in the hotel, you know, like uh, <laughs> cut it out and, uh, and, and prep your room. And in this way, you also avoid any uh, disappointments. Yeah. And, um, yeah, after this, we saw that it was slowly already working. The hotel got a lot of publicity, and uh, because there was a hotel in Amsterdam that advertised that uh, there was shit in front of their hotel, and uh, blah, blah, blah. But uh, then the, uh, we thought, like, the next year we make, like, a very luxurious campaign. So uh, I used this, I reused and stole this uh, kind of five-star hotel image, uh, and then uh, we just made a new logo because we thought like the hotel doesn't have the same logo. We make every time a new one. Uh, so now a very luxurious one. And then uh, it was all, uh, uh, have all these stars on it. And then it says like not included, you know, like, uh, so nothing in this picture is uh, included in the hotel. Ha. Ha. Yeah, and when we started for the hotel, they had like uh, 60,000 overnights, but then after two years, we saw it already uh, increasing. Uh, after this campaign, they had like um, about uh, 70 to 75,000 overnights. So we thought, uh, next year, we thought like, okay, maybe it's also nice to show like the people that visit the hotel, uh, the, the target group. And um, so we used this classical advertising trick of before and after, but then we turned it around. So it's uh, check in, check out, and bring a budget hotel. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of many examples of that, how, how horrible you look after uh, a few days in that hotel. And, um, but I mean, here we thought like maybe this is now, we can't make it any worse than this. This, this was almost the end of it, we thought. But sometimes you get stuck then, you think like, okay, what's next? You know, like we, we made it so terrible, so we made it so ironic, let's, what shall we do? But then, I mean, uh, it can't get any worse. We used that in our next campaign, so we said, Hans Brink, a budget hotel, uh, uh, it can't get any worse, uh, but we'll do our best. So there's all kinds of uh, little um, tips from the hotel, how to make it uh, a little bit better, also here. I mean, uh, this is like... Uh, there are three rooms in the hotel with uh, that kind of uh, view. I mean, it's not Photoshop, this. It's uh, like a realistic uh, situation. So it's better to close the curtain when you are uh, entering the hotel, the room. And also here, I mean, uh, the image on the right is much more promising than the image on the left, of course. So that helps a lot. Yeah, uh, another year, we, uh, there was all these boutique and design hotels uh, being very fashionable and popping up around the Hans Brinker Budget Hotel in that area. So we thought like, okay, maybe we are also, we have also unique design in our hotel.
Yeah, the horse is very important at the end. Eh? Like, uh, I thought a lot about that. Um, and then suddenly, after uh, 15 years working for them, we found out that the hotel actually had something very positive to offer because uh, we found out that the hotel was accidentally eco-friendly uh, because uh, they have an eco-towel in the room, which is the curtain, of course, and they have an eco-elevator, they have like an eco-shower, and uh, yeah, like sometimes these ideas that you have, they are already there, you know, because uh, this idea came from the fact that uh, the hotel sign that they had, uh, I was already for years pissed off that only the L was burning and I didn't repair it. So that was in a way the inspiration for this campaign because uh, up there it has also this eco fact uh, saying like uh, our hotel sign only uses 20% of the energy of normal hotel signs. <laughs> so sometimes ideas are just there, you just have to look very good and pick them up. Yeah, and, and then uh, there was also an English publisher who wanted to make a book with all the work for the hotel. Uh, we called it the worst hotel in the world, which is not totally true, but uh, I mean, at the moment the hotel has uh, more than 160,000 overnights per year. Uh, it looks uh, as shit as uh, when I came in, but uh, now it became their kind of trademark. And um, the fact is that uh, we didn't really reach our challenge with, uh, with this uh, client because uh, they still have a lot of complaints. But funny enough, people are now complaining often that they have been there and they think it's not bad enough. They had expected that it would be worse. So uh, that's quite nice. The good news is that they also opened a second branch in Lisbon, the Hans Brinker Hostel in Lisbon. And uh, yeah, there we also uh, show how they think about big groups, for instance, on their sites. And, um, and this is how we advertise the hotel in uh, Lisbon. We say like same hotel, lots of new complaints, of course. And uh, same dubious service, slightly better weather. Hans Brinker, Lisbon. Sit back and relax at our idyllic oasis. Yeah, luckily uh, we also got some uh, more upscale uh, client, clients after, uh, and also other hotel clients. So this uh, is a hotel called Citizen M. Uh, we also came up with the name of the hotel. It comes from Mobile Citizens. And this is a hotel that is made by these uh, modular shipping container size rooms in a way. And when they have a new premises, they can build a new hotel within uh, two uh, months. Uh, because they have all these uh, rooms, they're already uh, prefabricated. And uh, the concept of the hotel is uh, like budget versus luxury. So there's not a lot of... Uh, you have to do a lot of things yourself. You have to check in yourself, uh, get your room key yourself. So it, it, it works with all these kind of little irritations that you have when you go to a hotel that you have to wait at the reception and things like that. So, and, and basically the rooms are very... Uh, uh, all the luxury is put in the, in the rooms. So we made this kind of army of uh, mobile citizens that we use throughout uh, the communication and uh, in the hotel itself. Yeah, also this uh, budget versus luxury we make into the products that we have in the hotel. So this is like a, a bag that you get there. Also we did like the scent and the, and the shampoo bottle, so it's Citizen AM, Citizen PM. And uh, also the, uh, on the soap it says like designed to turn even the longest haul traveler into a sparkling, clean and nice smelling human being again. And um, yeah, the funny thing was that here we also got like a briefing to come up with the wake up call. 100, 99, 98, 97, 96, 95. Yeah. I stop it here, but that's very, uh, it goes on till zero, you understand it. Um, and then uh, the, the advertising for the hotel, this was when they opened up in London. It says, Citizen M says, uh, choose a hotel that's 400 meters uh, from here and a million miles from the Hilton. And um, yeah, this was a recent hotel opening in uh, London at, in the, at the Tower of London. So we asked uh, visitors in the hotel, uh, dressed them up as in this kind of budget luxury style as uh, royal citizens uh, with all the stuff from the hotel. And um, 
Yeah, like uh, recently also last year they opened in Times Square in New York and we did this action where we said like uh, we had like a, a limousine driving up and down uh, uh, in front of the Paramount uh, Hotel saying Citizen M says luxury is free Wi-Fi, uh, luxury is free Wi-Fi and extra large beds, not a stupidly long car. And also we had this guy walking up and down the Hilton Hotel with his carriage saying uh, Citizen M says a 24-hour bar and free Wi-Fi beats a guy in a silly hat carrying your bags. And then uh, this is a film that we made uh, also to post online to, to um, really kind of uh, uh, for once and forever stop with all the hotel cliches and also to promote the new branch in, um, in, in, on Times Square. I think this is also something nowadays what is very challenging for people working in, uh, in, in this industry and in design and, 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 and in architecture, fashion, advertising, because nowadays uh, you can cross over with a lot of dif disciplines. I mean, a lot of the uh, crafts and, and disciplines we're in have been, have been very democratic. I mean, nowadays, uh, I mean, there's so many people, graphic designers or photographers, or it's been very accessible if you compare that with uh, 10, 15 years ago. So I think that nowadays also as a creative, you can really cross over with a lot of uh, different disciplines. I think that, uh, yeah, we, we try to do that sometimes. Um, I mean, this is uh, more to show that you can also make like sculptures in a way. This, this is a school we work for and uh, they had like a lot of trouble in the campus. There are like 4,000 people in the school and then uh, they have a lot of rubbish in the campus and uh, on the floor there. So we made these kind of uh, permanent uh, installations and uh, normally your school would say like, don't do this and clean up after yourself. But here it says like, uh, on, on the garbage bag it says like, uh, throwing away garbage in the garbage bag, how difficult can that be? And then we made it very difficult. Also, we have this insulation where you really have to push your hand through and then try to get it uh, in. Or uh, this one is like with three people, you have to lift it up and then risk uh, your hand in there. And uh, so it, it works really well uh, because, yeah, people really uh, like to... Uh, uh, film how they do that and how they challenge to get to throw away their uh, garbage and that that works uh, quite well So sometimes it's really good to turn it totally the other way around and then and then you get like a uh, success in that uh, Another thing I like to show which is also kind of a crossover uh, We did like a organized a football match and also a uh, documentary you made because we found out that um, at the bottom of the the ranking of the FIFA there are two teams, uh, number two on the two and number two on the three, uh, Bhutan and Montserrat, and they actually never won a game in their life. Uh, so we decided to organize uh, during the World Cup of Soccer on the day of the final to organize uh, a, another final between the two lowest qualified football nations. And uh, so we did some research and uh, this is the national football pitch of Montserrat, which is like a volcanic island. And uh, so it was no idea to play it there. It's like uh, totally, you can't even drive with the car over there. And uh, so, we, so the, the, the game was played then in Bhutan and uh, the king of Bhutan gave us permission. And uh, um, so this is the, the team of Montserrat entering Bhutan. And uh, here you see the two teams, Bhutan and Montserrat. If you look very close, you already see who won and who lost because uh, you, you see that later. But uh, the, the game was really uh, like a spectacular thing. Like there were uh, 25,000 spectators in a valley in Bhutan. And uh, the, the game was horrible. I mean, uh, there was, it's worse than any amateur game you have ever seen. I mean, it was really uh, horrible to watch. But in a way, this whole game was about that these two nations 
yeah, that one of them would win and would uh, not be on the bottom of the list anymore. So we also made the cup, and uh, everybody got a half of it. And then in the end, uh, Bhutan won, uh, and they are now on uh, place uh, 199. Uh, Montserrat is still at the bottom. And I'll just show you a little clip of uh, the documentary that we made. On June 30th, 2002, the same day as the World Cup final in Japan, there was another final between the two lowest ranked teams in the world, the Buddhist Kingdom of Bhutan and the Caribbean island of Montserrat. was captured in a documentary that brings to life the story of this game through the experiences of the teams, organizers and the people of Bhutan and Montserrat. Unlike the World Cup final, this game was not about who won or who lost. I think there are two dimensions to the world of sports. One is the opportunity that it gives to individuals, to countries, to communities for social or cultural interaction. And that I think is the more important contribution that sports can make to society, through which it can promote peace and harmony, understanding among peoples. final was about two very different countries and cultures from distant parts of the world meeting each other for the first time and sharing their love for the beautiful game. We are draw. 2-1. Of course Manchester is going to win. What other result could there be? Manchester 3, Of course we are expecting to win. 3-0. I predict a very good game. The other final. Also nice for people who don't like football. I know because I've seen it. That shows also that you don't have to wait for another briefing to get on your table because I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I think creatives are very good when they are uh, also have their own projects and, and uh, do a lot with that. Um, yeah, now, now let's get back to the mistakes again. Um, yeah, again, I think uh, it's very important to uh, make these mistakes, uh, especially because everything is so perfect in, in, uh, in the industry that we are in. I mean, not in the world in itself, it's far from perfect, but uh, with our technology. And also, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, like, I get always a lot of inspirations by things that are uh, a bit wrong or that are not uh, perfect or... And a lot of, many times I find also a lot of it is in these kind of construction mistakes and uh, first you think it's all fine and uh, it... Uh, but then suddenly, also even in small ways, you think like, wait a minute, there's something uh, wrong here. And in a way, these things are very inspirational uh, for me. Also here, this billboard, I mean, uh, I think that this billboard has actually more, gets more attention than it would, when it would be posted uh, in the right way. So you can argue about that. Uh, also here, I think, uh, just small mistakes, uh, but quite... Uh, funny uh, things and, and, and quite good to use for ideas also. I mean, here I, I take these pictures also sometimes myself here, at least, I mean, they put uh, still the, the P there, so they still want to convince people to park there, but, uh, and also here, another parking. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, how is this possible? I mean, uh, and then, yeah, when you hate, yeah, <laughs> shit, I gave it away. 
When you really hate your children, you can bring them to this uh, playground because you put them in and then give like a hard sweep and then everything is finished. Because I, I can tell you from experience, you can really hate your children, you know, after a certain moment. Uh, but then they're probably not into this playing, playing this anymore. But uh, also here, this, uh, was, uh, this is on the graveyard in Amsterdam. And uh, I mean, this is how they think about uh, recycling people in Amsterdam. Can you believe it? To put like a garbage bin next to a grave. It's unbelievable. Um, yeah, I mean, here there was a clear example how to do it. I mean, it was, it was there. It was just right in front of him how to do it. But no, 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 no. No, he did a mistake. Okay, this is a shopping center where something goes wrong. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of balconies where things totally go wrong. The balcony was planned there, but the window was not yet there. And then there's also a lot of toilets. I mean, toilets are, in a way, the, the most mistakes you find in there. Here's actually a disabled toilet that they really don't encourage disabled people to go in there. But most of the time, people really, uh, yeah, they, 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 they want to have as many people as possible on the toilet. I mean, uh, the more the better, and uh, I mean, uh, hardly any privacy, but uh, look at this. I mean, how can you do this? Uh, or this one. I mean, uh, what a fucking stupid mistake. Unbelievable. And uh, here there's a disabled toilet again. I mean, sometimes when you, have the, you can't hold it anymore, you sneak into the disabled toilet, and then, you know, but. If you're not disabled, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, uh, you are disabled when you leave this toilet, uh, really. <laughs> yeah, this one, a little smart solution to open and close the door. Very smart design solution. And um, yeah, also here, I mean, a small mistake, <laughs> but very soon it's going to be a huge mess uh, in this toilet, I can tell you, really. And then uh, there's my favorite, which is this one. It's like uh, you take a piss, you wash your hands, you wash your dick, you, you, everything is like you're recycled and everything. I mean, there's a little towel there just to dry everything and fix everything. But uh, I mean, it is a fantastic design in a way. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and the only thing you have to do is just look for these things and, and embrace them and uh, yeah. Oh. I need to go to the toilet now, very... Uh, okay, yeah, the, finally, I like to talk about uh, uh, my hobby and also the fact that I think it's also very good to use your hobby in your work because, uh, I mean, uh, often hobbies are there as a thing that you do at home or, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of separated from your professional life. But I think creative people should really use their hobbies in their, in their work also, more and more. Because a lot of fascination goes in there, and a lot of times, uh, yeah, people are very uh, uh, strong with their hobbies. Uh, I mean, I, I uh, do a lot of uh, work, uh, I, I collect a lot of uh, photography, and I work uh, many times in making exhibitions with photography. Uh, this is an exhibition, it's called uh, 24 Hours of Photos. And uh, this actually uh, came because I, my fascination for the fact that we live nowadays with so many images. I mean, uh, I think uh, people see now more images before lunch than somebody in the 18th century uh, in their whole life. So that imagine what that does to our brain. You know, we really have to be editors and we really have to choose what to see and what not to see. So what I did for this installation, I downloaded 24 hours of photographs from Flickr, uh, everything that was uploaded in that period of time. And then uh, they were in total 950,000. And then I printed them for real and uh, just uh, threw it in, uh, in a museum. And people could really walk through and pick it up. And uh, yeah, it showed also how we are blurred now, we are blurring between private and public. I mean, the pictures that people walked on in that installation were very uh, intimate in a way sometimes. So, um, yeah, also I did that in other places. This is in a church in Switzerland. Uh, yeah, the priest was not very happy, but uh, luckily he got more visitors than normal. And, uh, yeah, in another uh, uh, installation I did is called My Feet. Uh, when you type in on Google, I'm bored, you see that a lot of people take a picture of their uh, feet. 
uh, because they're just bored. And uh, so in this installation are 3,000 of them, and you can uh, just walk over them and uh, yeah, take pictures again of your own feet. And uh, also I made it in, uh, to a skateboard ramp in, uh, in Germany in a museum. And uh, skaters could really skate in the museum at own risk, of course. And uh, yeah, and then I think the next thing is what I like to show is also, I mean, this this whole craziness of selfies and and people having to take pictures constantly is like really fascinating me. And uh, it turns out that, uh, for instance. Uh, we found about 8,000 pictures, uh, so I, I, with a group of people I did this, we, we, we found about 8,000 pictures of, uh, that man took of their dick with something next to it. So just uh, something like this next to it, just to show the size. And there are so many of them that uh, we edited that in a book, but just uh, over the course of a day, with all the items that you use during a day. So this is the magazine we make, it's called Useful Photography. Uh, and uh, this was already number, number 13. And of course, the first picture on the cover is the picture of the alarm clock next to a dick, because of course you start the day. And then, of course, the book uh, opens with, uh, you have to go in the shower, of course, in the morning. And uh, yeah, of course you, uh, I mean, these are all anonymous photographs and you can all find them online. I mean, when you dig very deep, of course, but uh, I have to say. <laughs> And um, yeah, and then of course you shave yourself, and uh, and the start the, the start of the day is slowly there, and then you uh, use some deodorant before you really uh, yeah you have to brush your hair also, and uh, and then slowly you start with the breakfast, you know, because uh, you have to get an egg, and uh, yeah, look, uh, it's like really, uh, I mean, it's very handy and very uh, comes in very handy. And, uh, of course, you brush your teeth after the breakfast. Uh, there's many brands of teeth, uh, toothpaste that you find. And, uh, yeah, then you leave the door. I mean, you have to leave the door of the house. Can you fucking believe it? I mean, uh, people, uh, unbelievable. Okay, when you leave the door, you go into your car. You... Uh, <laughs> driving, yeah, and then put a CD in the, in the car. <clears throat> and then, uh, yeah, you go to work. Some people use PC, others uh, use a Mac. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a lot of difference between that. And then uh, there's lunch, of course, and uh, you have to prepare that. Uh, then there's a little uh, cigarette break after lunch. Uh, you do some work, and, uh, and then after work in the afternoon, you have to think about already about uh, going to uh, buy the dinner for the night, so you have to spend some money. And, uh, okay, uh, but then uh, you find many of them with one coin on, so we have a double page in the book with one coin, with two coins, with three coins. <laughs> but the most coins we found on, on a dick is 28, 28 coins on a dick. Unbelievable. Can you fucking believe it? And, uh, okay, then you have a little bit of a break. Uh, you uh, take a drink, and uh, you have to go to the toilet, of course. Sometimes the paper is finished. Sad, but true. And, uh, yeah, then you prepare dinner. This is the classical one. Uh, after dinner, you do uh, some uh, music, of course, and you use the, the drums and uh, play piano. And then, uh, yeah, then you put on the television. I mean, the remote control is a very uh, good item for this, uh, perfect. This is the Sky remote control. And uh, a beer, of course, at the television. And then slowly the day is coming to an end. It's a bit of an anti-climax, of course. Uh, and then uh, people have sex and, uh, okay, and then uh, it's time to go to bed. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, then uh, you have the teddy bear, and uh, slowly the day is fading away, and then uh, we start again uh, the next day, and then... Uh... Okay. So, <laughs> Jesus. Good, we go on. Um, yeah, th this, is, uh, this is the fifth issue of Useful Photography, which I also very much like, and um, 
because it turns out that every country all over the world has um, a cow photographer. There's in every country one or two photographers that only take pictures of cows. And they do that uh, always in the same way. So they have always a piece, a piece of grass underneath the first uh, two uh, uh, legs. This is just to straighten the back of the cow. And uh, they always hold it in the same way, always behind the head of the cow. Uh, but every time, uh, I mean, the picture is the same, but the background is quite uh, different. And they do this, of course, because to keep track of the breed and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, so in this magazine it's all the daughters, or part of the daughters of this one bull called Lord Lily. And uh, so these are all daughters of each other. And, um, uh, yeah, like, like uh, um, uh, we also made a film of the Dutch cow photographer. Uh, because normally it takes about half an hour to take one picture like that. And uh, so you just see him at work. It's quite uh, remarkable. And it's a very, you have to be very patient as a photographer. And it shows how difficult that is. Rechts voor iets is achteruit, iets naar buiten toe. Ik heb de voorkant van het blokje iets iets grijs bovenop gooien. Oké. Okay. Start erbij, auto toe. Yeah, when when the car when when the uh, when the cow is in the perfect position, he goes to the car and puts like a cassette tape on there uh, with cow sounds to make the cow even more concentrated. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh. Blijf, blijf even staan, dan kan ik even de bak stakken. Dan loop je rekening in. the result of the day, yeah. so he made it. Um, yeah, and, and finally, I'd like to uh, end with uh, some uh, books that we published ourselves. I mean, uh, sometimes other people publish books or ideas that we do, but we also have a selection of books that we publish ourselves. And uh, I'd just like to highlight uh, a few of these uh, books that I made, uh, and they're all called In Almost Every Picture. And uh, these are all books uh, where the photographs, I found them. I never made the pictures myself. I found them on flea markets, online. And these are all pictures by amateurs that I really, uh, yeah, that I really like and that also have a certain story in them. And uh, amateurs, they are also, I mean, they are willing to make mistakes and they are often very naive in a very good way. And I, I really like that. For me, it's really an inspiration. Um, so it started with this uh, book and with this uh, collection of photographs that I found in Barcelona on the market. And there were like uh, about 400 pictures of this uh, Spanish woman uh, that the husband probably took these pictures over a pe period of 12 years. And um, yeah, so always uh, they, they really made kind of a photo shoot out of this. And, and yeah, there was a lot of love and dedication uh, to each other. And um, 
I started to put like all the pictures in order and all the colors changed over time. And uh, yeah, very beautiful uh, and very monumental pictures that he took of her, almost like a declaration of love. And um, yeah, very nice. Sometimes they brought like a, a rose, so she had to put that in her mouth. And uh, so it was really kind of an amateuristic uh, fashion shoot or photo shoot. And um, yeah, but then I found out when I was, was starting, when I started to put them in order, that uh, suddenly I found out that the woman became constantly smaller and smaller in the frame. Uh, the more he photographed her uh, over these 12 years, the smaller she became. So, uh, I mean, also when you look through the book, it's like a flip book because she goes like, uh, like this, you know, like... Uh, because, I mean, the last picture in the book, she's almost disappeared. I mean, uh, and it turns out and when, when people are for, for a very long time together and they photograph each other, that they take more distance to each other. And uh, it's kind of sad, but uh, on the other hand, uh, maybe she didn't want to be photographed close up anymore, or maybe he had more, uh, more an eye for the architecture instead of her. But it's, a, it's an interesting fact uh, that people uh, do that. Uh, another book that I did uh, was by an amateur photographer from Japan and he had a rabbit called Oolong and the rabbit uh, uh, turned out that he could balance everything on his head. And every day uh, he posted a new picture on his website and I went there every morning and it's, for, for me it was like a very good, good mood and a good start of the day. And uh, yeah, it was like it became every time more ridiculous and... Uh, I, I followed it for months, and, and it was so beautiful pictures. I mean, every day was like a gift. I mean, Oolong was a fantastic balancer. I mean, he, uh, yeah, he, this, these are like eight cookies on his head without dropping them. And suddenly, I found out one day that Oolong got sick, and uh, he had nothing on his head. And, uh, and then you could also follow day by day uh, his uh, progression of the sickness. And suddenly, I found this one. Uh, in, uh, on, on the next day, and uh, yeah, that was the end of it. But it shows also that some series can be very funny and it has sometimes like a sad ending. Uh, I went also to the next day, I went to the site, but, but I thought like it's over, but then uh, this was the last one that I found. And uh, these are two carrots, by the way. It's not his ears. And uh, yeah, and another book, uh, is uh, by a woman, uh, which you see here in the pictures. The, the photographs are by her. Uh, she's called Ria. And Ria, when she was um, uh, 16, she shot for the first time in a fun fair. And she shot at a bullseye of the a target. And when you hit the bullseye, it takes a picture of you. I mean, I don't know if you have that uh, situation here. But, uh, or you have that, that uh, uh, on, on the fun fair here. But she shot every day of her life after uh, 1936 and uh, it's very beautiful to see and I heard about her and she just kept them in a, uh, a folder at home. She lives in an elderly home and uh, yeah, in a way she documented her whole life. At a certain moment you see also her walking stick in front of her and uh, so I made the book for her, and this is, this is her, and uh, there was an exhibition, and she came with me often to the exhibitions, we traveled, and, but she wanted to bring a gun to the, always when, when, when she traveled, this was a plastic gun, uh, and then she was playing with it in the hotel room. And then, uh, yeah, they called her the woman who uh, shoots herself, and, uh, yeah, and then in the end, her pictures got sold to the, her originals got sold to the Museum of Modern Art, and then uh, they, um, yeah, then she gave numerous dinners and, and uh, because she got quite a lot of money for it and uh, bus trips with the whole elderly home. Yeah, and the last, uh, this is the last picture, by the way, that she did last year, so far the last one. And then the last uh, two books I want to show you is, uh, uh, this is uh, quite a remarkable one because I, uh, it's, it's uh, photographs I found in a family album. And this is a family who tries to document, or try, uh, tries to, to fight a little bit against one of the biggest mysteries in photography, and that's uh, how to shoot my black dog. And uh, it never worked out. I mean, uh, it is one big disaster. And all their life they were trying to document this black dog. And uh, so it's... Uh, 
They even decided to buy a black sofa, which doesn't really help. And uh, even in bright sunlight, they fucked it up. And look at this. And then uh, in the end, I found out that the, f probably they got so frustrated that at one moment, they really started to fiddle with the camera. And then, yes, once they made it uh, right, and they, they totally overexposed the image. And finally, I like to end with, uh, uh, yeah, this is almost comparable to the first book, uh, where a husband photographs his wife for a long time. And, but this is like a, a, a woman from uh, uh, Florida. She's called Valerie, and her husband is Fred, and Fred is the photographer. And Fred really likes to photograph Valerie in the water. And first with, with a bathing suit, but slowly also with her clothes on. And they slowly, the clothes were made wet. And uh, for them, it's really like a, a fantastic thing to do every day. You know, like uh, it's almost like uh, their kind of little fetish together. And, uh, but it got more and more extreme, you know, like uh, how Fred and Valerie made these pictures. Even in a, in a, in a public uh, fountain uh, with a flash at night secretly. And, uh, <laughs> and even when it rains, for them it's fantastic. The more rain, the better, you know, like uh, they go out and they enjoy it uh, really uh, much. The garden, uh, I mean, Fred is a very good photographer, of course, and uh, they have a swimming pool. Also for the winter, they use it. I mean, uh, can you believe it? And um, yeah, so then I made uh, the book. Because nowadays, also, Valerie uses everything in the water, puts everything in there, makeup, jewelry, the purse. I mean, uh, look at this. And then I made the book, but I, I um, sent them the uh, first copy of the book, and I didn't tell them that I printed the book on plastic, because the first copy that I wanted to send to them, I hoped that, they, that Fred would take a picture with Valerie with the book in the water. And... Uh, but again, I didn't tell them that the, the book was, on, was waterproof, but I said, like, take it in the water, it doesn't matter. So I got this uh, email, and it said, like, uh, hello, Eric, uh, I've uh, sent a dozen of photos from our afternoon book swim. Uh, I hope they meet what is needed for publicity. Uh, I have Photoshop touched them up for good presentations, and uh, I shot well over 100 views, and these are uh, the best. The shoot went very well. We were both in the mood. Uh, there was a light overcast, as hoped for, with no harsh shadows. Valerie wanted to know if the book was really to go into the water. I said yes. The book slipped down into the water, a little bit at a time, Valerie taking it and herself in deeper as the photos progressed. Eventually, it was fully under. She, we, enjoyed the tantalizing intrigue of it. Very sexual email, this. Uh, after the photo sequence, we both swam with the book, looking again at each picture. The water was not seeming to have any effect on it. Uh, we must have enjoyed two hours in the water with it. I rinsed it off in the house, dried off each page, placed paper towels between each page, and the book seems to have withstood a lengthy adventure just fine. Love the whole business, Fred and Valerie. And these are the, the results uh, that they took, and uh, this was my favorite. After this, also, uh, the, the photographs got uh, exhibited. This is in the a, in a Lake of Geneva. I made this installation with a photograph of her, and also in the, all over the city. There's even a fountain in the city with uh, pictures of Valerie. And uh, yeah, then I thought also, okay, now it's finished. But uh, recently, I found this picture on the internet, uh, the picture on the right, which was uh, an image uh, for uh, Stella McCarthy that they, did, that they made for their campaign and uh, totally ripped off the cover of the book. I mean, it can't be a coincidence that these things look so similar. So I sent these two pictures to Fred uh, and Valerie, and I, yeah, I said, like, uh, listen, you have to see what you do with this. And in a way, to sum it all up and also to, I mean, maybe infect you a little bit with my... Uh, a fascination for amateurs and for also how, yeah, that we need to make mistakes and need to be also a bit more of an amateur now, nowadays uh, prof as a professional. Uh, yeah, so Fred sent me this email back and that really sums it up. So he, Fred said, like, uh, we see the Stella photos, she does look a bit starched, not enjoying the adventure. <laughs> <clears throat> sort of makes one wonder why she would be doing it to start with. And then in the end he said, I would hope she would get satisfaction in eventually taking the whole outfit under. Thank you very much.
Thanks.